And our next guest, Palestinian-American journalist Leila El Haddad, is also concerned about the term genocide and what might be happening. She is part of a lawsuit that's been filed against the Biden administration, which alleges that it has failed to prevent it. She argues that the government's reluctance to call for a ceasefire is not only hurting Gazans on the ground, but also Arab and Mo Muslim populations, like in America, who are subject to heightening Islamophobia. And she's joining Hari Srinivasan to discuss her experiences in this highly volatile climate. This interview is part of Exploring Hate, our ongoing series on anti-Semitism, racism, and extremism. Christian, thanks. Leila Al-Haddad, thanks so much for joining us. You, along with a group of uh, Palestinian rights activists and residents of Gaza, are, are now in a uh, lawsuit that's filed against the Biden administration um, for failing to, quote, prevent an unfolding genocide. Tell us about the lawsuit, if you can. That's right. I'm one of many plaintiffs uh, uh, in this lawsuit against President Biden, um, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin. And it's just one, for me, it's just one small thing that I'm doing that I promised my family that I owe to them, both my family members, um, five direct family members who were killed in an mm -hmm. Israeli attack on their home with U.S. provided weapons that I paid for with my taxes. It's something small that I can do for them, as well as for the surviving family members in Gaza City right now, um, to hold my government to account in failing to prevent this ongoing genocide uh, against my people. Now, at the time that we're having this conversation, the Biden administration has not responded yet to this lawsuit, but um, uh, President Biden uh, has said repeatedly in the past that Israel has a right to defend itself from a terror attack. Um, why are you saying that the U.S. is uh, failing to uphold international law? Well, it's the, the biggest burden, which the burden of proof, which is proving intent to commit genocide, has been proven for us um, in numerous statements by Israeli officials themselves. And our government here, the United States, has been uh, abetting that, abetting the unfolding genocide that has already, whose intent has already been proven by way of diplomatic cover, by way of $14 billion um, in aid, and by way of, uh, of uh, rhetoric as well. So, you know, we have the military support, the diplomatic support, and so on, the political support. And um, so that is what makes this, this circumstance, this specific instance, um, so unique, so different than other um, instances where the United States has provided unconditional support for Israel. Did you have an opportunity to sit down with the Biden administration? I heard that you declined an invitation. Is that right? That's right. There was two separate. I was asked to participate in a roundtable with um, with Arab Amer members of the Arab American and um, Palestinian American community in the State Department. I was also asked to participate in a, later on, at the height of, of the attacks on Gaza um, at the White House, which I declined, um, because, frankly, it got to the point where it was feeling performative and um, not really bearing any real results. It was just something the administration was doing to be able to allay um, fears and say, we hear you, we feel you, but, but they don't. Um, and and it's the message has been delivered loud and clear that they've lost our votes in, in 2024. Um, and these efforts, frankly, are falling flat amongst the Arab and, and Palestinian and Muslim communities in the United States. I know that you met with uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in a, uh, in a setting, in a forum, and I wonder what were you able to say to him that you thought might have an effect? This was very early on in um, Israel's assault on Gaza. And really, I was hoping to use it as an opportunity to convey to him how I felt, how, as a, how we felt as a Palestinian and a Muslim community. I wanted to convey to him, I promised my cousins and my family in Gaza that I would convey their reality to him. Um, my main message was that all we're hearing, all I'm hearing is that Palestinians are barbarians and, and baby killers and, um, and 
the unhumans to which the law of war did not apply and that my administration was okay with that. That was the message I wanted to convey to him. And I asked him directly, what's the benchmark? How many Palestinians and how many children and women need to die before you are okay with finally calling for a ceasefire? And of course, we discussed the fact that this was not self-defense when 75% of the victims have been women and children. That is not only grossly disproportionate, that's reprehensible to call it self-defense and insist that there's no red lines for Israel is morally repugnant. So those were really the messages we conveyed. And again, the main ask was, um, was the ceasefire. Why do you think it is that calling for a ceasefire or a halt of hostilities or really however you want to phrase it, because even it seems the phrasing matters, why has that inherently become a political act or one that admits defeat for one side or the other? I keep saying that ceasefire has somehow become a dirty word, that you see our politicians literally um, engaging in, uh, you know, uh, verbal acrobatics just to be able to avoid saying it, right? Um, and the message that we keep getting from them, from different legislators that I've personally met with and officials, is that, oh, it's it's going to be bad optics, right? It's It's going to make it look like, you know, we're caving in. And, you know, Biden even used that word. He said we. He didn't see, he didn't say, excuse me, Israel. Um, does that make is he suggesting that that the United States is he admitting that the United States is complicit in this? Who knows? But the the fact remains that they consider a call for a ceasefire to be bad optics, as though somehow um, Hamas would be winning, that they would be caving. Um, but the reality is, the a large number of Israelis themselves are now calling for a ceasefire, coming out and protesting, let alone, you know, Americans as well, um, because there's no winners in this. There's no winners in war. Yeah, so I wonder if, look, you're an author, you know the power of words and language, and considering the emphasis you're putting on the way that the Biden administration is talking about Palestinians and about the conflict, do condemnations matter? and does it matter if President Biden condemns the actions of Israel or if you condemn the actions of Hamas? I think it sends a strong message, but I think what's more important, again, is actions. You know, actions to me speak louder than words. Um, and the actions of our government so far have been subpar to non-existent. Um, we've only heard over and over again that your lives as Palestinians simply matter less to us than the lives of Israelis. And again, that messaging has a direct impact on our communities here in the United States. So should Arab American, Muslim American organizations be condemning the actions of Hamas if they want the same condemnation back from the Biden administration towards the actions of Israel? Does, do those messages matter, is I guess what I'm asking. Our communities have always had to assume the burden of before even being asked about their loved ones and their families have always had to assume the burden of condemnation. We see, we've seen this happen over and over and over and over again, not only in 9-11, but long before. And I think the question um, that we need to ask is, you know, and, and I should say, and they've always come out and said, none of us condone violence. Human life is precious. 
But that's all anyone ever wants to hear from us. They're not interested again. They're not interested in our lives, our people, um, our rights. They're just hearing, they're just interested in hearing us um, condemn over and over yeah. and over again, just sort of condition us um, into condemning. And I think those two things um, should not be conditional. Recently, the organization CARE, C-A-I-R, which stands for the Council on American Islamic Relations, had uh, put out some information that is quite distressing. I just want to cite a couple of the things that they've received more than 1,200 calls for help. This is in the context of the, um, the, the war that's happening right now. And that's a 216% increase over the previous year. Essentially, uh, people are calling into this organization talking about anti-Arab bias in their lives. And um, what's your reaction to that? Have you been experiencing this? Unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I have personally experienced this. Um, I myself, along with my daughter, um, I was attending a rally in Rockville, Maryland last week, where a uh, very peaceful rally calling for a ceasefire, where directly adjacent to us was a very vocal, vitriolic counter protests that were shouting at us. And as you can see, I'm very visibly Muslim, things like animals, uh, barbarians, um, we're going to take your heads, go back home, uh, murderous Muslims, um, we'll kill your brothers, you're not welcome here, and on and on. My own daughter experienced this when she was walking in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. She also wears hijab, and somebody yelled at her, um, a baby murderer. Um, she has faced significant pushback at her school here in Howard County, Maryland as well, in trying to organize uh, something as simple as a walkout uh, to call for a ceasefire. I've received hate mail in my actual mailbox um, calling on uh, Israel to kill every expletive, I don't want to say, um, who mm -hmm. gives birth, basically any woman who gives birth to future rats and um, uh, threatening words saying to kill them all. Um, this has become, unfortunately, the new normal, or I should say abnormal um, in our lives. Uh, we remain vigilant, um, but the unfortunate reality is at a time when I should be grieving my family, and I've lost several uh, family members in Gaza, direct family, as well as dozens of extended family, I'm having to look over, over my back. And, um, you know, while it doesn't surprise me, it, the real problem here, again, is the way that the administration has gone about this. And and um, it's a direct result, I would say, of the dehumanizing and racist rhetoric that Israel has been using to justify its massacres in Gaza that then our administration here has essentially been promoting, regurgitating a lot of these lies. And that has a direct impact, effect on not only Muslim Americans and Palestinians, but as well as Arab Americans and a lot of people of color as well who are none of the above. Why do you think it is that Muslim Americans end up being the targets? I think the unfortunate reality is that while hate attacks and hate rhetoric of any kind is reprehensible, and I wanna say that loud and clear, it's my feeling that Palestinian Arab Muslim lives matter less to this administration and are therefore not highlighted um, as much uh, than non-Palestinian Arab and Muslim lives. I think that a lot of it has to do with othering, right? It's It's this idea also that, you know, we're not a monolithic group. When I say we, um, often what happens is when you have something, when you have, when you see something like what happened to Gaza, and when you see this dehumanizing racist rhetoric being rolled out by the Israelis, um, that then has a direct impact on media coverage and disinformation that is then repeated by our administration, that has a direct impact on our communities here. And our communities could be Palestinian, Muslim or Christian, it could be Arab, non-Palestinian, and they could be brown, people of color, who aren't even Muslim at all. Um, I've had a lot of my friends from the South Asian community here in Maryland who are Sikh and others um, who have been at the receiving end of hate attacks as well. 
And so it's this othering, I think, that contributes to to uh, this reality that you mentioned. You were in the United States after 9-11, and it seems that we're I'm going over some of those same roads. That's right. I, I was here during 9-11. I was actually in Boston, and I was a graduate student, and they were terrifying times. I won't lie, especially, especially for Muslims who were not U.S. citizens. It was difficult for everyone. But I felt particularly vulnerable as a stateless Palestinian and, and was myself detained and threatened with deportation to, to where I have no idea um, at some point while I was pregnant with my son in Logan Airport. Um, I'll never forget those days ever. And I, and I tell that story to my children over and over to teach them to be resilient, to teach them to speak out, um, to teach them to seek due process. I actually filed complaints against the FBI and, and that bore fruit to teach them never to give up, to give up. And and I and I the message I give them, especially my daughter, is the struggle is long and it is real and uh, and it is necessary. Um, so don't give up and don't get too comfortable because you have to not only speak out on behalf of yourself and your people, but on anyone who um, is the victim of a grave injustice and of which there are many that our government here has uh, has perpetrated. And um, so that's that's in summary the message I, I give her without victimizing her in any way or giving her this mentality that she's somehow somehow a victim, but to be vigilant and to be alert and to be vocal and to advocate for herself and for others. You've called this time period your your daughter's 9-11. What do you mean by that? I think this really hit home for her for the first time, um, meaning what was happening to Gaza and to her family in Gaza and how that was directly related to herself here as a young Palestinian, visibly Muslim American. And so I call it her coming of age moment in the sense that she was suddenly in the throes of all of this um, at the receiving end of hateful um, vitriol that was being hurled at her, um, at the receiving end of intimidating tactics as she was trying to do something as simple as, uh, you know, call for an end to hostilities and and she couldn't believe that this was happening and i you know i didn't want to tell her well welcome to the club but that's why i call it her coming of age moment she she suddenly realized um this is real and there are real threats and and um you know people will say things to her that are mean and hateful and um and try to silence her when she simply tries to speak out in support of uh, freedom and equality for her people so this is the unfortunate reality we live in. But again, it's um, it's a moment that I hope she will learn from um, and, and you know, a teachable moment. It's unfortunate that it had to come in this way, and I don't wish that upon anyone, obviously. Palestinian author and activist Leila Al-Haddad, thanks so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you.